Okay, we're filling up fast. Wow. We're at 35 already. Good evening. Yes. Guntersville. Yeah. Let us know where you're from. It's interesting. We get some people all over the country at these webinars. So it's really it's neat to see where everyone's from. So if you want to put that in the chat where you're from, that'd be great. I saw Puerto Rico up there too. I had one a few months ago. I think it was Korea. And I've had just, it, it is amazing. We get a lot of internationals. So So good evening, everyone. I'm just going to go ahead and get started so we can get this presentation going. My name is Laurie Davin. I'm with NAFTA and welcome to the NAFTA 2022 webinar series. Tonight, our uh, webinar is sponsored by Merrick Pet Care, and we have Dr. Danielle Conway and Dr. Ruth Ann Lobos with us. Welcome, ladies. Um, just to let everybody know, everyone is muted. So if you have a question during the presentation, they're asking if you can put the, the question in the Q&A, not in the chat, and we're going to hold the questions till the end. So if you have a question on a beginning slide, go ahead and put it in the Q&A. We'll get to the questions at the end. Um, so this is an approved CE also, so certificates will be sent out in the next week or so. So right now, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lobos with Merrick, and welcome. All right, welcome y'all and thank you for joining. I saw we got some folks in Puerto Rico. I know there's a maybe a tropical storm Fiona bearing down on y'all if you stay safe these next couple of days. I just flew home to Boulder, Colorado from Orlando and so the the uh, activity in the Gulf was was a hot topic all around there. But um, thank you so much for taking the time out of your evenings and your days of saving lives uh, to join us today uh, to learn a little bit more about nutrition. Uh, but before we get started um, with that, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself and about Merrick. Uh, so I'm a practicing veterinarian. I have been in the pet food industry almost 20 years. Um, I am, have supported the ProPlan Veterinary Diet brand for quite some time. And then supported Purina Institute, um, and now for the last three years have been the lead veterinarian at Merrick Pet Care. And what most people are not familiar with is the fact that, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, is that Merrick actually ladders up and is underneath the Purina umbrella. So we are a strategic brand within the Purina portfolio that is really focused on natural and organic. So you can see under the umbrella of the Merrick name, um, you can see here, we've got Castor and Pollux, Merrick, Polar Farms, and Zooks. And I'm gonna go into those just really top line for y'all um, because if you're anything like I am um, when I'm in practice, I, I get a lot of clients who are very um, attached to their nutritional philosophies. And they really, you know, they want to feed natural or they want to feed organic. And I want to be able to recommend something that is super safe for them, that is going to deliver on the nutrient profile that they need for their pet and all of that. So um, just wanted to take a little bit more uh, time to just kind of double down on who we are as a brand underneath the Merit portfolio. And you can see we've got a team of experts here. Um, I'm going to 
hide ourselves and move so you can see some of our folks. There's me, but there's also Kevin Wise, who's head of our R&D. We've got Carrie Kramer, who is a, um, a nutritionist on board for us, Janika Hall, who is also in our um, R&D department, and several others who all make up our team of experts that go into formulating our recipes. We were started about 30 years ago, a little more than 30 years ago, down in Hereford, Texas, and we still have that facility down there where we manufacture all of our wet and dry products, as well as some of the Purina cans um, that you'll see come through are also manufactured in our Hereford facilities down there. And really, as being part of that Purina portfolio, we are able to tap into their team of experts, their supply chain when needed, um, and really be able to lean into their R&D and all of that where it makes sense. But we still operate as an independent natural brand, again, focused on that uh, consumer who is really looking for something natural or organic. Um, in the Merrick line, we've got all, it's now shifted. We started, definitely started more focused on the grain-free and over the last probably three and a half, maybe four years now, um, it's about a 50-50 split between the grain in and, and the grain-free options. Um, I will say our wet recipes are a whole lot of fun. Um, I really love these. I really lean in, especially when I've got patients who are sick or maybe just their appetite is just kind of off for a little bit. Um, our wet recipes, I will put them up against anybody's in the industry. Um, they one, they're a lot of fun. You can see they'll have real whole foods in them like the baby carrots, but they're also really super delicious and highly digestible. We've got everything we've got on the dog side. We certainly have paralleled on the cat side as well. And um, there's just a couple of examples. We've got the pate form, the, the morsels, um, kibble, all of that um, that's there. If you have, if you're in there with your clients and you've got people talking to you about really wanting something that is organic or sustainably sourced, that's where our Castor and Pollock line um, really comes in. The organics is the only um, complete line of USDA certified organic pet food, both for cat and dog, and there's treats involved as well. Our pristine line has, it really leans into that sustainably sourced or grown um, proteins and, and vegetables that are there. So again, these are things that are people hold dear, near and dear to their hearts for their own nutritional philosophies. And then if they want to extend that to their pets, um, they have these options. And then certainly our Zooks, um, both the mini naturals as well as the puppy naturals are fantastic training treats. These guys are about three calories a piece. So again, offers a lot of opportunity to be able to train, but keep their diet complete and balanced and not add to uh, their waistlines all at the same time. Um, so please don't hesitate. That was super overview. I just wanted y'all to kind of learn a little bit more about our brand and how we ladder up under the Purina umbrella and their portfolio. Um, but if you've got further questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, but I now I really want to get to the meat of our presentation, and I am going to hand it over to uh, Dr. Conway, but I'm going to introduce her first, uh, and because she's got some pretty amazing credentials, some that aren't listed here that I'm still going to share. So um, speaking with y'all tonight is Dr. Danielle Conway. She is a board eligible veterinary nutritionist who's been in advanced nutrition training program since 2014, and she completed her nutrition residency in 2018. After building a clinical nutrition service as, at a busy specialty hospital, which is no small feat, she joined the medical education team at Rare Breed Veterinary Partners to provide nutrition education and support the network's over 120 hospitals. She is a busy lady. Dr. Conway is developing a nutrition advocate training program to empower Rare Breed's veterinary support staff and highlight the importance of proactive and actionable nutrition recommendations in daily care. What she didn't put in the bio that she sent me is she also sometimes doubles as a marriage minister as well as she is a mother to some adorable little kiddos at home. So she, I don't know how she does it all, she, but she does and always smiling. So with that, take it away, Dr. Conway. All right, let's, thank you so much. I love to be here. I love to teach and educate. Um, anytime that anyone will hand me, hand me a microphone or a Zoom call, I am more than happy to jump in there and 
um, start talking. So tonight, I uh, hope you all are on the right talk. This is going to be food for thought where we're going to talk through all the different um, pet food options out there for our clients and the pros and cons of each, hopefully pretty balanced. So this is a giant picture of me and a little bit about my background and training. I also am certified in acupuncture, spinal manipulation, rehabilitation. I was into integrative medicine and set up a few integrative medicine services uh, prior to my foray into nutrition. Tonight's objectives, like I said, we're going to talk about the pros and cons of all the different feeding options, commercial over the counter, commercial therapeutic, homemade, raw, and other we're going to get into pet food labels and understanding them, understanding the ingredients and available options for clients, and then also how to navigate popular trends. You might see that listed in other talks as myth busting. I don't like calling it myth busting because I really believe at meeting clients at their truth and educating them. And it's our job to help them come up with a, a diet that they're not only as healthy for their animal, but they feel comfortable feeding as well. So just kicking that off, food is intensely personal. There are so many opinions on food and nutrition. And so, you know, I, I sometimes will give a version of this talk to uh, breed groups and clubs, and I always get heckled, always get heckled. And so I put this up there to show people that, uh, yes, it's going to get personal. Um, let's, you know, keep it professional. And, and we were all allowed to have our differences of, of opinion. And I bring that to when I meet with clients too. So I have clients that have very different opinions than I do. Um, and like I said before, it's really, I view it as my job to come up with something that they feel comfortable feeding. Because if you're too black and white about your recommendations and what should be done, like medicine in general, then your compliance from clients is going to be really poor. So almost approach talking about nutrition like you would, you know, religion or politics with people. I know sometimes just don't go there, um, but nutrition you have to. So approach it um, respectfully and delicately with, with clients. So some of my communication tips, I also, um, I'm developing a nutrition advocate program for rare breed. And I, I have a whole talk on communication and how to communicate to clients. Um, some of my tips are making a connection with the client being curious about why they're feeding a particular diet or a feeding option that they are, um, trying not to judge them no matter how seemingly out there their choice may be. And then also check our biases at the door. We have lots of them just in life and especially in veterinary medicine. And um, the less that clients feel judged, and I always joke that with clients, this is like Planet Fitness. And so when you walk into my exam room, um, it's like walking into Planet Fitness, it's a no judgment zone. I just need all of the information to make the very best recommendations for Fido fight, fight or Fluffy. Just a little bit, a little bit peek into, into my brain and kind of the way I think about nutrition. And I adopted this from Dr. Sarah Bood, who's another nutritionist. She put this up uh, many years ago at a talk I attended, and it just made sense to me. It actually blew my mind. And there are so many different feeding options out there. And a lot of times you'll hear people talk about nutrition in very black or white terms. Do do this, don't do that. You can't do this, you can't do this. You have to do this, you can't do that. This is not safe, this is safe. This is the best, this is not the best. Well, there are so many options out there. And while we have some really good research, we need a lot more. And we don't know what is the very best feeding option out there. Is it therapeutic diets? Is it homemade? Is it raw? We don't know yet. And so this curve is kind of how I think about nutrition in general. It looks like the oxygen saturation curve um, for those of you who are into respiratory physiology. And my point being is once you kind of get to the top of the curve where it flattens out, we don't know where the good options are. So as long as you have a reputable company doing lots of good testing, good manufacturing processes, feed trials, et cetera, performing research, um, you know, I think the individual differences are with each individual animal. And so that's what this little colorful piece of DNA over here is. And this is called a single nucleotide polymorphism. And so basically what that is, is it sums up the differences between you or I, or dog to dog, um, litter mates, and ex explains why certain individuals can or cannot tolerate or do better on or don't do well on any particular diet, why some animals react to drugs the way that they do, um, why some dogs are having issues with dilated cardiomyopathy. That's a whole other talk. We won't go there. But I think single nucleotide polymorphisms and 
there's lots of different options that are out there that are really good for our patients. And so when we're making our recommendations, keeping in mind that while an owner's option may not be our top choice, um, there's lots of other good options out there. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll feel a lot more comfortable um, coming up with a plan B and a plan C for clients who are just not willing to feed your top recommendation. So what are some of the challenges in having nutrition conversations with clients or even our neighbors? Uh, there's lots of information on the internet. There's lots of misinformation. Oh gosh, there are so many non-trained individuals masquerading as experts, especially in the digital age of influencers. Influencers have a platform, they have a huge following, and I don't know about y'all, but I have seen a lot of influencers advertising for pet food companies and some of the things that come out of their mouth. I just, I have a slide later that is a, you know, a good graphic of that, but a lot of the things that they say are, are not accurate to put it diplomatically. There's a history and perception of pet food and companies, and there's also the proprietary information. You know, companies, a lot of them do really wonderful research and some of that information they're able to share with us, some of it they're not. And so that can, you know, not sit well with certain people. I've heard clients that were upset about that, but at the end of the day, it's still a business and they have to protect their intellectual property. So it's just something that we all have to live with. Moving on to labels and ingredients and the most common areas of confusion. So on a label, the ingredients are listed in decreasing order by weight. And so wet ingredients that have more water and less nutrient are gonna show up first on that label. Dry ingredients that have more nutrient and less water are going to show up, you know, closer to the bottom of that label. Uh, for example, chicken. Chicken listed first. It um, may or may not represent the most of the protein component of that particular food, um, whether or not it's you know, they measured the ingredient raw when it first came in the doors of the plant, or if they dehydrated it down first, or they used a chicken meal, which is the water has been removed, then that it won't weigh as much as a raw chicken with the meat in it, and will show up lower on the ingredient list. And, you know, companies, it's up to the company how they want to list it on their ingredient panel, totally up to them. There's really not a lot of regulation in that. And so there are some companies who try to be very transparent and say, okay, we're going to treat all our ingredients the same. We're going to dehydrate everything. And then we're going to weigh it. Then we're going to decide how that goes on our label. So it's very consistent where other companies uh, know that the consumer want to see meat as the one, two, three ingredients on that pet food label and purposely try to make it kind of as heavy and, and um, as top of the list as they possibly can. So, you know, interpreting a pet food label and saying, oh, chicken's the number one ingredient. There's going to be tons of protein in this diet. You can't say that. And on the label, an area that can be really confusing is the no, no, no list. And this is what really I don't appreciate. I don't like this in my politics. I don't like it in my pet food. I would rather a company or a pet food list what they are going to do or do well or talk about their benefits as a company rather than slamming uh, the competition. I really don't have a lot of respect for that and don't love a no, no, no list. Sometimes you'll see on some of the pet food labels, no this, no that, no, 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 no. And by the get to the end, you're like, well, goodness, what's in their pet food? <laughs> Your no, no list is so long. So moving on to byproducts, byproducts can be really an area of, of confusion. A meat byproduct is not hair, horn, hooves, teeth, or feces. A poultry byproduct is not feathers or feces. And in any sort of byproduct, there is never allowed any roadkill or euthanized pets, no matter what an online documentary or documentary on Netflix will tell you. There is no roadkill or euthanized pets allowed in AFCO as a byproduct. So then what is a byproduct? So don't talk about the no-nos, talk about the yes, yes. Uh, so byproducts are potentially edible animal parts not widely consumed by the American public. It is the part of the prey first consumed by predators and is often consumed in other countries as a delicacy as part of their normal day-to-day -day food. Uh, on the right is a picture of my former dog eating a pizzle stick. Does anybody know what a pizzle or a bully stick is? I guess I can't see the um, I can't see the comments here, but feel free to drop in if you know what animal part a pizzle or a bully stick is. 
And this they're is all, a- they're all right. They're they're all right. They're, they're it, filling it in. Gloria. It's a full penis. Yeah, clients. So I used to work in a pet food store, you know, long before my my veterinary medical career. And clients, you know, come in, I only want organic. I only want, you know, this and that, and I don't want any byproducts, but then they'd buy, you know, oh, but goodness, you know, you know, Fido really loves these bully sticks. I need cases of these. And I would point out to them and say, you know, gosh, Mrs. Smith, do you, you know, that's what that animal part is, right? That's a whole penis. And they would be absolutely horrified. And so that's a fun little bomb to drop in the exam room sometimes, as long as it's, you know, I think it's appropriate with that client, they won't get too offended. And so byproducts are actually very, very nutrient dense. And I made this chart here to show the comparison between just breast meat or just skeletal meat and then skeletal meat plus uh, byproducts in the form of of giblets um, or the insides of chicken and then the neck. And so as you can see, the protein content is higher, the retinol or vitamin A is higher in the the meat with the organ meat with with the byproduct the phosphorus content is lower, which really comes in handy if you're trying to do something therapeutic with that food, like make a renal diet, for example, and the iron content is higher. And this is an example showing that in other countries or even in the US, their byproducts are considered delicacies. So sausage, sausage, who knows what's in sausage, everything, everything in the kitchen sink, but it's delicious. So as long as it's safe, do we really care? This is trite or cow stomach, classic steak and kidney pie, haggis, which is sheep lung, goat lung with red pepper, delicious chicken feet, smoked ponds with greens, which is pork stomach, kind of like tripe, but the, the pig version. And carbohydrates, so it's true, dogs and cats do not have a carbohydrate requirement. Uh, they do, on the other hand, require cellular glucose and their brain and their kidneys and their red blood cells need cellular glucose to to operate optimally. And so how they get that glucose, it can come from a variety of different biochemical pathways, which I will not go in tonight, so you're welcome. Um, But the carbohydrates, dogs can utilize up to 65% of carbohydrate and greater than if the grain is uh, 90, greater than 98% digestible and cats can utilize up to 40% dietary carbohydrate, but I don't think they should. That's just my own personal, I think a diet that should not have 40% or more carbohydrate for a cat, which is an obligate carnivore, but it's nice to know based on the research that they, they absolutely can do well on, on diets that have a good substantial amount of carbohydrate in them. And so this is the schematic I was talking about earlier when some of the clients walk in the room and you want to have strong reactions to the things that they find on the internet, whatever piece of misinformation that is. And so this is actually a, a real, uh, real occurrence for me had a client come in that said, Dr. how do I look? And they pulled out their phone and they said, look, and this diet that you recommended has corn in it. And I Googled it. I Googled corn kills dogs. And this is what came up. And sure enough, this was the first hit that you Googled at the time, corn kills dogs. You click on this link and it came up with this cute pit bull puppy uh, relieving himself, saying that dog's body cannot process corn properly. It's difficult for them to digest. Corn is a cheap filler, starchy energy, which serves little to no nutritional value and a lot comes out in their waste. And so when you're dealing with any misinformation, whether it's nutrition or not, by the end of the day, especially if it's been a rough day, I'm sure we all want to have this kind of a reaction, but we are standing in front of a client and we cannot. So we just take a deep breath and educate them. And so taking a look at a grain-free diet and marketing is that it's it's a huge market. There is a huge diet um, for grain-free marketing. And it's actually increasing. Interesting, it's been increasing um, even throughout the dilated cardiomyopathy issues. The, the, the feeding has remained the same. And that's a whole other talk that I give, but um, is possibly another reason to say, oh, maybe it's not, it's not the grains. It's not the grain free. It's not the just adding grain if the market has continued to incline and that the DCM cases have remained steady. That's a whole other talk for a whole other day. Um, and it is maybe not what you'll hear a lot of nutritionists talk about, but um, so what is a grain? What well, something I found in clinical practice, and I'm sure y'all have the same experience is Clients don't often understand what they're doing or what they're asking for or why they're asking for it. And so sometimes just simply educating them on, oh, it sounds like, you know, grain-free feeding is really important to you. Um, You know, why is that? And, you know, what is a grain? When I'd make homemade diets for clients, you know, I'd throw out some ingredient options and they'd say like, oh yeah, that's fine. That's fine. 
And then they say, but it has to be grain free. I'm like, well, well, rice is a grain, but you just said it was okay. I'm like, yeah, but rice is okay. Okay. Um, so a grain is wheat or any cultivated cereal crop. It is a true grass. Um, wheat, barley, oats, rice, corn, millet, rye, and sorghum are true grains. Pseudo grains like buckwheat or quinoa, they're non grasses, and so they're considered a pseudo grain and they're technically not a grain. Now, some grain facts if they're properly cooked, grain is well utilized by both dogs and cats. Ground corn um, can be greater than 91% digestible if it's processed correctly. Uh, dogs and cats, something you'll hear from clients is that dogs and cats can't process grains. That was going around on the internet for a while. So they physiologically, I used to hear this, they physiologically physiologically can't handle it. Dr. Conway, they don't have the enzymes necessary to break down carbohydrates. That's just flat out not true. Um, they possess bo both amylases and disaccharidases in their bodies that break down um, grains or carbohydrates in general. And interesting, some early research in people have linked increased wheat and rye intake with a lower incidence of distal colon cancer. Now this is human data, it's not veterinary data. And my guess is it's associated with the fiber, um, but it is interesting that possibly could carry over into our populations or maybe not because we're dealing with carnivores and obligate carnivores, so it might not. So many grain-free foods have compared a comparable level of carbohydrates to the grain-inclusive counterparts. This is just highlighting that uh, some clients will think that by feeding a grain-free diet, they're feeding a carbohydrate-free diet, and that's just not true. So usually what happens is when the grains are removed, they're re replaced with um, legumes or pulses, potato um, or other um, you know, beans, chickpeas, um, lentils are replaced with other sources of carbohydrates that can contribute just as much raw carbohydrate or percent carbohydrate as the grain-inclusive um, counterparts. And so green, where, where I think, and I have seen this quite a bit in clinical practice, is there are some dogs other than just the Irish Shutters, the Irish Shutters, the poster children, the Irish Shutters, and um, the Wheatons um, are kind of classical for our possible um, celiac disease in, in dogs. But I've seen, a, I have seen a gluten sensitivity in breeds other than just our classic Irish setter. It is not a fulminant allergy, um, but it is a sensitivity. And so I think it is worth kind of understanding what is gluten. So gluten is a protein mixture comprised of glutenins and gliadinins. It's found in um, wheat, barley, rye, and tripe kale. Those are the glutinous grains. Um, oats are technically gluten-free and a lot of these particular grains on the right-hand side are gluten-free, but as you'll see in just a, a moment here, it's often contaminated with wheat when harvested or processed. So even if um, the ingredients have, or you know, if you're looking at the grocery store for a, a gluten-free option, you need to have you know, gluten-free labeling on there to make sure it hasn't been processed with, processed with wheat. And so these are the, all the ingredients that do not contain gluten. So all the grains that do not contain gluten. And just, you know, I love playing devil's advocate. I love presenting both sides of an argument. And so, you know, there could be something to gluten-free or even grain-free feeding. Um, and there has been more human research coming out um, recently, relatively recently, 2019, this one's from 2019, showing that um, amylase trypsin inhibitors are kind of a grain's natural defenses against pathogens or predators. And they can be very inflammatory to individuals who are sensitive to them. And so this particular study looked at eight, the eight wheat amylase trypsin inhibitors are known as ATI. So it looked at ATIs, not only in the gut, but also in the airways. And it found that these ATI free diets, the mice, um, the mice that had been implanted with human um, cells. So it was like a human airway in a mouse. Science is amazing. Um, these ATI free diets had less airway inflammation than the diets without it. And again, this is again human data hasn't been done in veterinary patients, but there could be something to this. 
And so what are our grain-free conclusions? We could have a whole talk on just grain-free, um, but you know, in a nutshell, um, domestic dogs are more adapted to starch digestion. You know, Yorkie's not a wolf. There have been no proven benefits yet. And that's always my big thing. There's no proven benefits yet, but there's no harm with a balanced diet that has been well formulated by a trustworthy company. And that's my big caveat. I think that formulation is non-binary royalty and the company and the scientists that are formulating the diets. And as long as they know what they're doing, um, it's going to be a safe product to feed. Uh, I think do think that grain free at the at the moment is more consumer driven marketing, um, although the science may catch up with us and there is more and more research popping up in the human world um, that, you know, I would hate for all of us to eat crow in the veterinary world saying, you know, this is ridiculous, it's just consumer driven, it's just market driven, there may be some valid science to it so I do not. Um, I do not discourage or disparage uh, clients who really are interested in. Um, a grain-free diet for their for their dog or cat. They may be more calorically dense than the grain-inclusive counterparts, so that's something to keep in mind if you have an overweight patient. Uh, and that grain-free does not mean carb-free, and just making sure that owners understand that. Sometimes it does, sometimes it does not. Um, and that some dogs might actually do better if they're avoiding gluten or ATIs. I've seen it clinically. It can happen. Um, I really would love to see more research come out and just how prevalent that is in the, especially canine community from what I've seen. So what are our pet food options? We have commercial over-the-counter, homemade, other, therapeutic, and also raw. And so we won't, I won't touch on this much, but I do think it's interesting in that looking at the commercial pet food history, we have dog food really hasn't been around for all that long and has really been influenced by what's going on in the world. For example, World War II, um, it was canned food that had predominated previously, but with the shortage of aluminum, they had to find other options. Hills was the first prescription diet that came out in 1943. The first diet was KD, their kidney diet. Introduction of extrusion came about in the 1950s. So extruded pet foods really only been around since the 1950s. The Pet Food Institute launched a marketing campaign to discourage table scraps in the 1960s. AFCO was formed as uh, developed in late 1960. Uh, the melam melamine pet food recall happened in 2007. And then um, also worth adding to this timeline is dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, di dietary related diet of cardiomyopathy that has happened since about 2020. So what are some of the pros of feeding commercial diets? I think we're all pretty familiar and comfortable with these. So we have AFCO, which also stands for the American Association of Feed Control Officials. It sets the nutrition standards or model regulations. The FDA um, specifies some label requirements, regulates health claims and ensures safety. The USDA regulates ingredients and inspects research facilities and the state departments of agriculture in, enforce um, animal food regulations within the individual state. So when people will say, oh, pet food, no, it's not regulated, nobody's paying attention to it. Well, it's not as regulated and people aren't paying as much attention. You know, the USC and the FDA aren't paying as much attention to it as the human food, but there is still levels of regulation that's occurring for commercial food that wouldn't for, let's say, a homemade diet. They are complete and balanced if they've been AFCO formulated or tested. They are convenient, cost-effective, and it doesn't get much easier than feeding a dry food, much more convenient and easy. So what are some of the potential cons? So there's the argument that is the regulation enough? You know, there still continues to be pet food recalls. And I have a whole other talk on that about how to deal uh, with pet food recalls and, and my, my big issue is that recalls are not a bad thing. Recalls are a good thing. If you're a company that's doing your due diligence, you've got your GMPs in place, uh, you should find issues, but hopefully the issues are being found uh, with a test and hold before that product gets out to the public. And so often issues should be being fixed before that product even gets out. Now mistakes happen. They're ultimately, we're, we're people behind, behind the products. And so um, hopefully we have found that the issue before you know a lot of animals get sick and then the company has responded uh, responsibly and quickly um, to helping those animals and clients out who have been affected. Is the are the AFCO guidelines you know meant for real nutrition for our pets? So who knows? An AFCO feeding trial isn't very long um, and it's certainly better than nothing. You'll hear um, you know some people get up there and say, oh it's too short, it doesn't really tell us much, there needs to be better. I don't disagree with that, but 
it's what we have and it's absolutely better than nothing. People get confused because pet food labels provide little information about the quality of a diet. That is true. Are these diets really complete and balanced and nutritious? And what about variety? Um, do pets need variety? That's more a client preference than a pet preference, but some clients are pretty adamant about it. So how to overcome all of these cons is just by recommending companies you trust. So we look to make sure that a company has an AFCO um, testing statement or feeding statement, that they have an industry analysis or have performed a feeding trial. Ideally, they do both or at least do both on their top selling diets. What life stage is that pet food for? Is it for adult growth or reproduction or all life stages? Worth noting is that there's no established geriatric senior or performance labels. So each company kind of sets their own standards for that. So it can be quite variable company to company. Is the company transparent? Do they have clear manufacturing and contact information? Are they willing to share what they can of their supply chain and where they source ingredients from? Most companies are very proud of that. Um, and they're often proud to give pet food tours to veterinary individuals because they're proud of the work that they're doing. And then consumer preferences. Um, are we looking for natural or organic? Do they have those options? Um, the ingredients, um, human grade animal byproduct, meat meals or ingredients lists can be very deceiving. So that can be a little tricky to navigate. So I have a whole handout and it's actually where well, you can find it on the Wasaba toolkit online. Uh, it's questions for a pet food company. I have them that I hand out to clients. And if they come to me with a new food that I haven't heard of before, I give them homework. I hand them this sheet and I say, you know, please call, call up a company and go ask. And I also have them call up um, a reputable pet food company and ask the same question so that they compare, can compare the quality of the answers that they're getting from the questions from a company that I trust and then from one that I don't know. And they'll often be able to say, you know, they'll come in for their next recheck. I'll say, oh, you know, Miss Smith, how had that diet evaluation go for you? And she goes, oh, those answers were terrible. They were nowhere near what, you know, the other company said. So I, I'm just, I just threw it out. I'm not going to feed it anymore. So they'll even, they'll do that work for you. So does the company have either a nutritionist on staff or some sort of equivalent in their company? Or do they consult with one? Are they available for consultation or questions, diet formulation, who formulates their diets and what are their credentials? I kid you not. I've heard a couple of times that a diet was formulated by their grandma in their kitchen because grandma makes really delicious chicken pot pies. Not a joke. I wish it was. AFCO, uh, which of the diets are AFCO feed trial tested? Which of the diets have been AFCO nutritionally analyzed? Quality control. What specific quality control measures do a company have to assure the consistency and quality of the product line? Most importantly, does the product that's going into the bowl match what's on the label? And what do they do to ensure that? The plant, um, where their diet's produced and manufactured, who a lot of them use co-packers, they don't make their own diets. And so uh, they should at least be able to tell you who their co-packer is. Uh, could the plant be visited? Uh, do they own the plant? As far as a nutrient analysis goes, can they provide a complete product nutrient analysis of their best-selling canine and feline pet foods, including digestibility values? Calories, um, could they give us, they should, it's a legality issue now, it didn't used to be, but the company legally on the bag of either treats or the food or the canned, there has to be the calorie content of that diet. And then recalls, when was the last time a product had a recall? Um, and like I talked about before, a lack of recall is not better. If you're not looking for any problems, you're not going to find any. We just don't want to see recalls happening frequently. So what are the different therapeutic diet options? We all are probably very familiar with Hills, Purina, Royal Canaan, great, excellent companies. There are some other options available for clients who just absolutely will not feed those. So there's Blue, Veterinary Recommended Solutions, and also Rain. What are some of the pros of a therapeutic pet food diet? So they are formulated for disease states. Some of them can be fed safely to healthy pets as well. They have lots of company support, research, product consistency, and quality control. So a therapeutic diet is meant to be utilized like a drug. It is meant to be utilized like a drug to treat a specific disease. And it has so much quality control and assurance behind the product that is tested, the ingredients are tested before coming into the plant when they get to the plant. There's sometimes it's tested throughout 
the, the manufacturing process and certainly at the end. And there's usually a test and hold as well. So that, for example, if you're feeding a renal dye, you know that the FOST first level is consistent and matches in the bag, in the bowl, and on that product label, um, product label and the product guides that the therapeutic guide that companies are giving you. Um, there have been no recent recalls with therapeutic diets. Um, there were some with vitamin D and Hills relatively recently in the last couple of years, but prior to that, there were none. Uh, there was no issues with melamine and therapeutic diets. Uh, there's little to no contamination because again, it's meant to be utilized like a drug. And we'll get into that a little bit later about the contamination issue when it comes to uh, diet trials for skin allergy dogs or IBD dogs and cats. Uh, and they have nutritional analysis that are performed. So what are some of the cons? Owners may not want to feed them. It's, they can be expensive. They're hard to get a hold of. You can't just buy them at your local pet food store around the corner or at Target. Um, veterinarians are often unsure of proper use, especially beyond whatever you know product guide is handed to them by the pet food company. Um, we need to let owners know that a diet is made just like medicine. That can often help with a lot of compliance issues is treat this diet like you would a vial of amoxicillin. The pet may not want to eat it. There might be a food aversion. I'm not a huge fan of giving a nauseous kidney cat in the diet, forcing them to eat a renal diet. I want them to eat whatever they want to eat in the hospital. We can get them onto a kidney diet later once they go home and are more comfortable. The, they are usually, sometimes they're not complete balance. They're being utilized to treat a disease. And so they may not have the recommended levels that AFCO or NRC are setting for a healthy, otherwise healthy adult animal by design. And if there are other pets in the household, that can be a whole complicating factor. So circling back to the contamination issue. So um, this particular study looked at testing common food antigens in four dry dog foods that were commonly used in dietary elimination diet trials. So they went to the pet food store, they grabbed a bunch of novel protein diets off the shelf and they ran alliances on them. And uh, it is no accident that these two pet foods look pretty similar. And so they had lots of a very excellent, robust study design that had over-the-counter venison diets that the requirement was venison was listed as a first or second ingredient. It did not contain soy, beef, or poultry, a negative control of canine dry venison sold only through veterinarians and three positive controls over the counter. And so what did they find? They found that three over-the-counter diets tested positive for soy with no soy listed on the label. One of the over-counter diets was positive for beef wah, wah, when there was no beef on the label. And this one is my favorite. One over-the-counter diet was falsely negative for poultry, meaning that it had poultry on the label, but no poultry in the actual food. So what do you do with this information? Again, you feed companies that you trust and circling back, it's really, really, really important to stress to only use therapeutic diets for diet trials. So for the six to 12 weeks, please, please, please um, talk to your clients and talk to if your veterinarians are, are sometimes making these recommendations, don't use an over-the-counter diet for a diet trial. Um, if that pet gets through the diet trial, and the owners can't continue to afford the therapeutic diet or just can't do it for whatever reason, um, then they can maybe try an over-the-counter diet later. Um, but in the meantime of the diet trial, have them feed a therapeutic diet. So as far as natural and organic, so there's actually truly definitions out there by AFCO on natural and organic diets. And the natural diet is all ingredients and components of our ingredients other than vitamins and minerals are not chemically synthesized or altered. So the biggest thing is that they're not chemically synthesized or altered. There is a specific definition for organic crops grown without the use of conventional pesticides, artificial fertilizers, or food additives, meats reared without the routine use of antibiotics or growth hormones, and the organic mar market, including pet food, has reached 60 billion annually and 13% increase in 2020. Organic can be really hard to, to source and recommend. Organics um, is one of the only brands that I know and trust um, to actually be providing a 
greater than, I forget what the exact percentage is, but it's greater than 80% or 75% organic. Sometimes you'll see companies that are doing organic, but there's you know less than 20% organic ingredients in the diet. Homemade diets. So homemade diets um, can get a bad rap. They are time consuming and they are expensive, but they, they can be done well. Um, clients could have a negative pet food perception. Um, they'd want to avoid additives and preservatives. They want a more holistic or natural diet. And then there's also growing anthropomorphism in that uh, people want to feed their dogs and cats the same way that they would feed their children with fresh whole food right off their table. There is clinical significance for homemade diets too. They can be used for, for elimination diets. Um, and there also might be no commercial dietary option available, such as food allergies and diabetes, depending on the protein exposure, renal disease and pancreatitis and more. What are some of the homemade diet challenges? We already talked about cost. A 60 pound Labrador retriever needs about as many calories as a small adult woman. So about 1200 calories a day. And that can be expensive, not only in the ingredients needed to complete the diet, but also in the vitamin and mineral supplements to make it complete and balanced. It is time consuming. And there can be diet drift. This is usually what scares many nutritionists away from homemade diets is that they're afraid of diet drift. It happens. What you formulate on paper ends up being very different from what the owner ends up putting into the pet's bowl. It starts with often innocent enough swaps and substitutions. Oh, I didn't have this. I'm just going to get that. Or, or, oh, this is less expensive. I'm going to grab this ingredient rather than what's listed in the, in the recipe. But it can end up looking very, very different in the bowl um, than on the formulation um, software. And it's true, they have not undergone nutrient analysis or food trials the same way that um, well-regulated um, pet foods have. How do we overcome some of these challenges? So getting clients back in for a recheck, um, making it convenient. So when I do homemade diets for clients, I make it as convenient for them as I possibly can. I teach them how to batch and freeze safely. Flexibility, so I let them use it as a canned food option if there's other diets available that they can combine it with. Saves them time and money. Um, lots of guidance. So it's usually a very dedicated clientele um, who, if provided enough instruction and, and support, will make sure that every I is dotted and T is crossed and will follow every instruction to the T. Um, I have them purchase a gram scale and actually weigh out their food, um, each ingredient to make sure that there's no diet drift and then get them in for rechecks, 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 and actually walk through the recipe with them to make sure they're making it the way that I've instructed them to. And there's so many times that clients will say, oh yeah, I know a doc. It's the way that you told me to do it. But when you actually sit down and say, well, tell me, I know it's, I know it's redundant. I apologize, but I don't mean to waste your time. But this is important. Let's talk through this. You will find so many errors that are being made in the diet formulation um, and get the help get them back on track. And it's important to do that periodically when pets are on a homemade diet as well. So I usually do two weeks and then depending on if they have any nutrition responsive diseases, every you know two to six months at least if they're on a homemade diet. They do weigh-ins, regular lab work, and that, that handy dandy gram scale and detailed and, and cooking instructions. So how do we evaluate a homemade diet? So this is one of the recipes that I found offline. It looks delicious. What are the issues? You can imagine their issues if I picked on it. So there's no vitamin or mineral supplement. There's no calcium source. The website mentions a multivitamin, but no instructions on how or which one to add. Just based on the recipe, there's going to be not only deficiency in calcium, but the calcium phosphorus ratio is going to be off. So not only is that complete portion important, it's also the balance. The nutrients need to be in the right proportion to another because nutrients can actually compete with one another or be required for absorption at the right ratios um, as each other. So the balance is as important as the complete part. The diet's going to be low in copper, zinc, magnesium, vitamin D. There's no omega-3 fatty acids in there. Um, there's too many peas in there, too much pea in there for, for my comfort level, especially without and having been sent out or being monitored by a, a veterinary, veterinarian or veterinary nutritionist, olive oil is not actually a good source of essential fatty acids for dogs and cats, although the turkey alone might be providing enough, um, would have to see. Um, the ingredient amount should be exact. We'd prefer to weigh them out in a gram scale and be listed in grams. What percent lean is the turkey? 99% lean or fat-free ground turkey is going to be very different and results in a very different nutrient profile than 85% um, fat 
turkey and you can kind of think of fat as a diluting agent. The more fatty a diet is, the more it dilutes out vitamins and minerals and other ingredients. So you need to compensate for that because you're making the diet more calorically dense. And when you're re measuring out the ingredients, you need to specify if they're going to weigh them raw or weigh them cooked, weigh them and then cook them or cook them and then weigh them. So that makes a difference in, in what the final nutrient profile looks like as well. So what are some sources for homemade recipes? Um, we are going to be offering some, not, we're not offering some right now, but right now the American College of Veterinary Nutrition is the place um, to go. PetDiets.com, BalanceIt.com is wonderful, as is most of your university uh, programs, such as the University of Tennessee. So what is a raw food diet? A raw food diet is known as a biologically appropriate diet. It's also known as bar for bones and raw food. It is the nutritional philosophy of feeding domesticated dogs and cats as if they're still in the wild. It's the ideology that processing food and ingredients can decrease their nutritional value. So back to, back to the drawing board. So you hear a client is on a raw food diet. We don't need to panic. We'll just go back to our nutrition diet history, which we're hopefully getting in all of our consults, or all, um, excuse me, all of our consults, all of our appointments, and find out what exactly they're doing. Is it homemade raw? Is it um, a commercially produced raw that's not AFCO? Is it an AFCO approved raw? Um, does it contain bones? Does it have veggies, et cetera? Is it just... This is also from a case, a just someone who's feeding a lamb skull in their backyard to their dog a couple times a day. And then most importantly, why is the owner feeding this diet? You got to meet the client at their truth. You guys are going to be so sick of hearing me say this by the end of this talk, but it's it's so true. That's really how we ensure compliance is meeting the clients at their truth, finding out what they're doing. It is it because the breeder told them to? Is it because their landlady told them to? Is it because they saw an ad on TV. Um, is it because that they're um, a breeder themselves and they've been doing this for 30 years? You know, all reasons are potentially valid and, and need to be uh, factored in. So you probably all have heard, you know, dogs are wolves and we should feed a dog like a wolf. I have a couple issues with that argument. So there was the study performed by Axelson et al. in Nature that looked at the genomic comparisons between dogs and wolves and found three major differences in their alleles. So they found that there was behavioral changes. So not surprisingly, we all know wolves are more aggressive than dogs. There was differences in starch digestion. Um, domesticated dogs had a lot more amylase expression to digest carbohydrate than a wolf did. And also dogs had more uh, competitive sperm than a wolf did. And so you'll hear this myth that, you know, dogs share 99% genetic material with wolves and therefore should consume a prey-based diet. Well, according to the research, maybe not. But along those lines, you know, pretty, pretty much every living being on the planet shares 90 something percent or more of genetic material with the exception of the fruit fly, which is 60%. But that's pretty incredible. You know, when you consider a human and a fruit fly have a 61% of the same genetic material, human and a chimp, 96%, a human and a cat, 90%. And individual differences of all of us on this call are only, or we share similarities of 99.9%. .9%. So we only have 0.1% differences. And I'm sure if you ask everybody, you know, hey, how do you do? We're going to have some people on this call who can't handle gluten, who can't handle dairy, who you know, do better when they eat X, Y, or Z. Um, so that very small percentage can make up for a huge different um, phenotypically. So that small percentage genotypically can make up a huge difference phenotypically or what actually the performance is of the animal and those genes. So what are some raw food diet challenges? So formulation. So how is it formulated? Who formulates it? The calcium to phosphorus ratios are the things that I find to be the most off um, because not only do you need to have enough calcium, you need to have the right amount of calcium to the amount of phosphorus in the diet. That ratio needs to be correct. Um, and that most commercial over-the-counter raw food diets are, are not balanced even with a raw food claim. There are some companies doing it well. Um, Merrick is doing it well. Instinct's doing it well. Still and Chewies is doing it well. That's pretty much it. Um, I had a colleague who rounded up a bunch of raw foods and sent them out to be analyzed. And a lot of them, even with an AFCO statement, were unbalanced. Uh, they didn't come back as meeting se several essential nutrients. Um, homemade diets, the same. There was a study showing that most of the rounded up the homemade diets in books, in journal articles, 
um, and sent them out for uh, evaluated them and sent some up for analysis and greater than 90% of them were unbalanced and less. The only three that were out of the 200 that they evaluated had been um, formulated by either a veterinary nutritionist or somebody with advanced veterinary nutrition training, like somebody who did a residency. There's the safety issue. Um, sorry for that little digression. Um, a safety issue, both the patient and public, the patient public health, so there needs to be mitigation factors for that or considerations. And then there are the mechanical obstructions if bones are being utilized um, in a whole format. So lovely picture of some bone obstructions. And then the aftermath of what happens, what the that port esophagus looked like after the obstruction was removed. There is the public health issue, uh, dogs and cats, especially today more than ever, they're kissing our faces, they're sharing our beds with us. Um, we are picking up their poop. There are studies, several of, many of them, showing that, that raw food feeding could potentially result in public health issues. Although I'd really like to highlight the last one. Again, I love to be devil's advocate. So there is a pediatric 2006 study looking at children who got salmonella, but it was from the pet food bowls. And it was, these were pets are being fed commercial over the counter uh, kibble and canned food, not raw food. So there is a contamination. We always, you know, vilify raw, uh, but we also need to be talking about and considering the contamination issues that can happen from just pet foods in general and why we need to, you know, practice good hygiene with our pet food bowls. And I mean, might need to be extra safe if we have little babies crawling around playing in the pet food bowls or, um, you know, a grandma that is undergoing chemotherapy or even another animal in the home that's undergoing chemotherapy. So are there ways to make it safer? Yeah, there are. High pressure, high pressure pasteurization is one. So high pressure pasteurization is um, when you process or, or apply pressure to the particular food or ingredient so that it cleaves the non-covalent bonds or those hydrogen bonds. It leaves the um, covalent bonds intact so that it doesn't affect any of the bioactive components in the food. It doesn't affect the flavor. It shouldn't affect the vitamins or minerals. It doesn't denature the proteins. Um, it has been around in the human market for a long time, and it is rapidly expanding in the pet food market. Um, of note is that there are many different protocols for HPP, how much pressure, how long, what kind of packaging, um, and those HPP Protocol should absolutely be validated. So make sure that the company's getting the bacterial log kill that they expect to be achieving, not just, hey, we do HPP, isn't that great? Well, are you actually reducing your bacterial log number? Or if they have none to start with, then that's great, but at least testing it after to make sure that um, the HPP is doing what we hope it's doing. Oh, my goodness, we just skipped way ahead. Um, so why are owners still interested in this feeding method? We talked about the risk. Why are there still some owners interested in this feeding method? Who are these clients? Well, they can be very knowledgeable and they're important individuals in our pet community. They're extremely dedicated to their pets. They've often been using raw food diets for years. And if we don't help them, Dr. Google will. And there's a lot of nutritionists who won't or veterinarians who won't even talk about raw food diets with clients. If you eat a raw food diet, nope, not touching you, go away. Um, but I really feel strongly that that's not doing them any service or any justice. And that if we don't help them, they're gonna go to Facebook chats and get really uh, inaccurate information that could be potentially dangerous for them and their animals. And so I really feel an obligation to help these clients out because there are good options, there are. And what are some of the other reasons? I saw Dr. Wynn, she's another fellow nutritionist and she presented this at, um, a talk with instinct and it really resonated with me and that what are some of the potential benefits in feeding a less processed food? Um, it could be, it's cause it's more, could be more complex, could have a higher antioxidant. Well, these are all theoretical too. These are not have been scientifically proven yet. Um, they could have a lower toxin load, um, uh, toxin load we'll get to in just a minute, which is a past area of research of mine. Um, they have more, uh, more bacteria in them, which could actually be beneficial as long as it's not the pathogenic bacteria, um, which could help diversify and, and make a more robust internal flora. Uh, and then the synergy and matrix of the ingredients used, how and in what proportion um, could really come together and work well for a product if it's well formulated. So what are these toxins I was talking about? Well, advanced glycation end products are a 
I want to talk about a little bit of chemistry here. Bear with me. A non-enzymatic reaction that occurs between aldehydes, which are the reducing sugar, and the free amino groups of proteins. And it is the Maillard reaction. So it is that delicious brown that forms on a, um, a grilled steak or grilled meat. It's that delicious sugary uh, part. And um, there are internal, so our body makes AGEs and there are external AGEs. And it has been shown that an increased intake of external AGEs will increase our internal AGEs as well. So it's been shown that it will rise. And there have been studies showing, um, this is a group out of Mount Sinai who has done um, about a decade and two decades now worth of research in NVS glycation end products and worked out all of the pathophysiologic mechanisms. I could get into receptors with you, I won't. Um, but they have shown that in people, if they eat a low AGE diet, they will improve their insulin sensitivity improve their glomerular filtration rate if they have uh, renal disease that is a result of their diabetes. It has also been researched in cancer, um, laryngeal cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, um, prostate cancer, um, et cetera. It's, it's pancreatic cancer. There's more and more um, AGEs are inflammatory in the body. And so could exacerbate, could exacerbate um, any chronic inflammatory disease. And so what made me get interested in AGEs or even thinking about them was this particular study that came out that looked at um, commercial pet food products. And they found that the average daily intake of um, hydroxymethylfurane is an AGE, HMF, is 122 times higher for dogs and 38 times higher for cats on the average intake for adult humans. Wow, that's a lot. So we know in people, and this is only recently being studied in dogs and cats, but it can have issues in sensitive humans. Could there be an issue or should this be something we're thinking about in dogs and cats, considering that they're taking in 122 times and 38 times a level that you or I would take in just in the nature of their diet? So what does it mean? There's no need for alarm. I'm not saying that we should be getting rid of all commercial food or extrusion or, or canning at all. Um, I don't think that it's cause for alarm yet. I think it's, it, it, we need to consider it. I think that, you know, going back to that colorful little DNA snip that I showed before, the single nucleotide polymorphism, I think that's maybe where this could come into play and explain why, oh, maybe some client, uh, patients do better on a homemade or chicken and rice diet than a commercial pet food or one would do better on a raw food diet from a reputable company versus, um, you know, a canned or kibble. There are companies that are doing research on this right now. So the Companion Animal Nutrition, Can We, um, and Wellness Institute is doing research uh, with the University of Georgia um, and also Instinct Pet Food is researching this as well. Um, there are some raw companies that are doing it very well. Um, some that are, most are not. <laughs> Um, do they have a veterinary nutritionist on staff or do they consult with one? Do they have well-qualified formulators? Do they do feeding trials? Do they do research? Do they sponsor nutrition programs in vet schools? Sponsor the veterinary community? Uh, promote education? Merrick is, is, is here tonight with us um, promoting this event and sponsoring this event. Food safety, um, it should be multifactorial. We'll get into that in just a moment. Um, and also environmental sustainability, we'll also get into that as well. You know, when you're feeding a very meat heavy diet, um, what are we doing to potentially offset some of the environmental sustainability issues that we're creating? So there should be a multiple hurdle approach when making safe raw food. So not only in doing HPP that's been validated, but also looking at um, potential food safe antimicrobials like probiotics, um, and then also food safety programs. So are there people walking around while the pet food is being made, swabbing various surfaces, making sure that there's no um, bacteria present if there are shutting down the whole line or at the end before the food is sent out a test and hold to test for not only salmonella, but campylobacter, E. coli, all of the other big, big bag bugs. Some companies only test for salmonella and only test their chicken. And so this was something that um, Instinct put out that is Wasava compliant and is some questions that you can ask a company, a raw food company um, to help evaluate if their food is safe. 
So what about the CDC? What are their recommendations? So, and mine as well. Um, so shared households with children under five, the elderly or if they're in immunocompromised individuals, both two and four legged, I think raw food should be avoided or at least utilized with extreme caution. Uh, therapy dogs in many hospitals now ban dogs that eat raw foods. Um, good hygiene, we need to implement, re implement really good hygiene. We'll get into that in the next slide and promote the appropriate handling of raw meat. Um, and then if possible, gloves when cleaning up stools or using the bag um, and washing hands and bowls. Just again, good common sense hygiene. And these are just more good common sense hygiene just accompanies HPP. Is there a multiple kill step protocol being utilized? Is there testing? Are we washing appropriately? You know, the same common sense stuff that we do for our own food preparation. We should not eating it raw, but, and it's also worth pointing out that with homemade raw food diets, a chicken is allowed to be contaminated with salmonella. USDA allows for commercially sold chicken to be up to 30% contaminated with salmonella. So 30% of the chicken that you find at the grocery store is going to have salmonella, not if, is, absolutely is. Um, it's allowed. And so with that being said, you know, we, we get very, very um, upset when talking about raw food diets, but I do think it's important to keep in mind that dogs are gross and they love gross things. They eat their poop. They eat the cat's poop. They eat their neighbor's poop. They eat their rabbit poop. They eat roadkill. They eat, I did my veterinary training in Wisconsin. And so, you know, the dogs, the farm dogs would eat the raw placenta as soon as it came out of the cows and they'd mouse and catch their own vermin. Um, so you know, not, not promoting any of those things as valid feeding options for a dog, but I think it is worth um, just taking with a grain of salt that dogs are different than people and are kind of gross. So looking into the other type companies, the, I call them ingredient-centric. Ingredient-centric canned and kibble options. There's commercial and homemade and homemade hybrids. So these are my ingredient-centric um, diets. So the pros is they're convenient, they're safe, the meats are cooked, they're convenient. They have great quality control and good manufacturing policies. They're not homemade and the cost can be very reasonable or at least comp comparable. The cons are that for some clients, it's not homemade. So if you have a diehard homemade client, it's going to be a con that it's not a homemade. It's not a con for me. It might be a con for the client. Cost. So even where cost might be a pro, it's less expensive than homemade or than, than some raw. Um, it may still be more expensive than, than other foods that are out there because of all of the ingredient quality and testing that's going into the food is what I try to explain to the owners. So what are these companies? They're Merrick, um, Major's Rider, Instinct, Rain, Veterinary Recommended Solutions, and Anime. Um, there are also commercial therapeutic options that are ingredient-centric, and they're Rain, VRS, and Blue Veterinary. And something else that I would really love to highlight and that just really warms my heart is I love to support a company that is going out into the world and doing good things to make a difference. Now, Dr. Lobos can probably speak to this better than I can, but Merrick supports this project. That's um, Canines for Warriors, which is a university funded research project that is doing research to get more therapy dogs or service dogs, not therapy, service dogs into the hands of, of wounded war veterans. And there's been lots of data showing, thanks to the great research, that these service animals are hugely beneficial for these individuals' quality of life. They help them get through their day. They prevent them from committing suicide. They, are, they, they help our wounded warriors function and reassimilate back into society. And why is that research so important? It's to get the insurances, the health insurances, medical insurances to pay for these animals um, and help support them for our, our wounded war veterans. Because these animals can be expensive if you're paying for them out of pocket because they're very highly trained. And so this is an initiative that Merrick funds and supports and um, you don't really hear much about it. And so wanted to highlight it and show when I'm, when I'm choosing a company that I'm going to recommend and promote, um, we really love companies that are going above and beyond. So not just the good quality control, not just the good testing, uh, making a quality product, but also what are they what are they doing to give back to the community as well? Not only in education and support, um, but beyond that. So some of the commercial homemade options. This is for your your diehard homemade clients who have more money than time. They don't want to make it themselves. Um, they want something convenient. 
So what are the pros? They're convenient. You just open and serve or you add water and serve. They're safe. The meat are cooked. It's convenient. They have good quality control for the most part. Um, uh, they are homemade. Sorry, I shouldn't say not homemade. I should say are homemade. Um, the cost varies. It can get extremely expensive. Um, and so what are these companies? So um, they're not, and when I say not homemade as a con, it's it's not like a fresh homemade. You will have some clients who are like the diehard homemade. They're like, if I haven't made it fresh within the last 12 hours, it doesn't count as homemade. And that's their opinion. Um, these companies are just food for dogs or nom nom. Now those are really the only two commercial homemade diets that uh, companies that I think are, are really doing a good job. And then what are some commercial homemade hybrid options? So those pros, um, they're convenient. You just open them and serve them. It's again, safe the meat are cooked. They're very convenient, um, good quality. Cons are cost. These are usually very, very expensive diets. And again, they're, they're, not, they're not that hardcore homemade. Does this matter? Who knows? I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe not. Maybe for certain individuals like that, the single nucleotide poly polymorphisms that need that fresh food. I don't know. Um, and these are companies like Just Food for Dogs, Fresh Pet, and Noss Kitchen. And so while we're talking about, you know, very meat-heavy diets, um, you know, my proposed dilemma, I saw this in my internship and thought about it when I was sleep-deprived and up late at night and all night, um, was wondering how we're going to feed a growing human and animal population on unlimited resources, and that many of the common pet food trends are in direct conflict with environmental sustainability. So what is a sustainable pet food system? So this is my definition. I made this up. It provides a sufficient energy and nutrients. It is synergistic with the human food system. It does not compromise the ability of future generations to meet their nutritional needs. And it absolutely is an issue. It's an issue in the United States in addition to globally. So one out of five children in America struggle with hunger. And I'm, I'm not okay with that. I, I love dogs and cats. I also really love kids. So I came up with this crazy idea to try to see if anybody, anybody, hello, Bueller, anybody out there that cared about environmental sustainability and pet food as much as I did. So I made a, a questionnaire and a pamphlet and went out to uh, veterinary clinics and fairs and booths and pet food stores and handed it out to people and had them fill out the questionnaire, read the informational pamphlet, and then fill out that same exact questionnaire after, and then did some statistical analyses to see if there would be a difference. That's an example of the pamphlet. And those results, we'll move through this kind of quickly, um, was yes. So the owners were able to understand the information and apply it. They were able to identify what environmental sustainability does, what environmental sustainable ingredients were, um, and that they were uh, less likely to feed um, diets that were less environmentally sustainable after reading the informational pamphlet. And so what does this show? I was surprised about this. You know, I had seen so many commercials and so many discussions with clients that I had just said, I, you know, I don't care about science and facts. I, I care what I care about. Um, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. But this study showed that um, owners will listen and assimilate information about feeding their pets. So your voice, everybody on this call, your voice is actually stronger, even though it may not feel like, I feel like you're biting the computer at the end of a lot of long days, that your advice is stronger than the influence of media and even neighbors. And so and what are some other ways that we could overcome this? So, you know, I am an admittedly a protein pusher. Uh, dogs and cats are very high protein requirement. And I don't think that we should sacrifice their needs and their wellness um, for the sake of environmental sustainability. So what are some other things that we could do for that? And when I first made this slide eight years ago now, uh, the world I don't think was ready for <laughs> this was their reaction, people's reaction when I would normally throw this slide up back in the days when we present in person. Um, we're ready for an earthworm diet, which actually has a higher protein content than mammal meat or fish. But now um, I am extremely excited that Purina is coming out with a black soldier fly larvae diet they already have. So uh, I don't think it's hit the market yet, but it is well in the works and is very exciting and hoping that many other companies will follow suit. So again, to wrap it up, it really comes down to choosing a, a trustworthy pet food company. You can find 
lots of different options for our clients that they are comfortable feeding. And when they're comfortable feeding it, they're going to be more compliant. They should have good GMPs. The company um, should have an AFCO label, a co-packer, uh, who, know who their co-packer is, co-packer is. They should be able to tell you who formulates their diet, what their credentials are, um, should send out their foods, at least the most commonly uh, fed ones, the most popular ones out for analysis. They get a gold star if they do digestibility testing, if they care about environmental sustainability, if they support funding for the veterinary community, funding for research, education, and the advancement of the field in companion and animal health. Um, so how do you know if the company that your client is feeding is, is abiding by any of these principles? So you just call and ask. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Conway. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I feel like even having uh, been in the industry for as long as I have, um, it, I still, every time I hear either you or a different nutritionist present on this uh, topic, I'm always like, oh, I learned some new nuggets. Um, so, so thank you. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, the first one, and I know you've talked about this, it could be a whole lecture in itself. So maybe in the interest of time, um, the elevator version that says, can you comment on the link between grain-free diets and dogs and heart disease? Um, and I don't know if you can give a, a brief overview on your perspective of, of the link between grain-free diets and, and the DCM that we're seeing. Yeah. All right. Let's do a 20 minute elevator pitch on that. I can talk to you <laughs> for the remainder of the evening. How long do you have <laughs> right. tomorrow? Um, <laughs> but my 20, kind of 20 second elevator pitch would be, um, it's not as simple as just saying avoiding grain free and the data that's coming out is actually supporting that. Um, and it is looking like peas, potentially diets that contain a lot of peas, there could be something in the pea that is causing a, some sort of damage to the cardiomyocytes or heart cells um, that could be affecting the sensitive dogs, not all dog sensitive dogs, because we have to remember that the grain free market is huge and DCM cases are, are not mirroring that trend at all. Um, and so to me, at the end of the day, the takeaway is formula and the company is the non-binary royalty of it all. And that if you're feeding a good food from a good company with people that are formulating the diet well and testing it, um, then I don't shy away from feeding grain-free. I know, <gasps> heresy, <laughs> but not at all. I, I use grain-free diets all the sure. time, all the time. Sure. All right. Thanks. Um, second one is, have you ever heard of Zeewee Peak dog food? And if you have, would you recommend it? I have, and I would not. Okay. There you go. And again, um, there was one that popped up and I put it, put the answer in, but, um, criteria that are great for evaluating, as, as you mentioned, the wasaba.org um, nutrition toolkit is fantastic, has a great list of questions, um, that either, you as technicians, or it's a great handout to send home with clients and they can go and, and do the research on their own as well. Um, Robin had a question with what is the purpose of feeding a light diet to keep a pet at its current weight? Mm -hmm. Yep. So light diets are um, just calorically less dense. And that is actually a term that is regulated by AFCO is that it ha has to contain, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, um, but it has to contain, I believe it's less than 300 something calories per cup. Um, and so it, the, the purpose of it is that it will help obese prone animals stay lean. Great. Um, and then we had a question, if there are clients who, that are wanting to prepare a raw diet uh, or home-based diet, do you commonly just recommend them reaching out to a dietitian or are there other resources that they can direct them to? Yeah, they really do need to work with a, a nutritionist um, to make that safely. Yeah. As of right uh, now, no other good and, resources I know that are easy and quick, unfortunately. Right. Um, because balanceit.com, is, is that still a veterinary linked resource or can consumers go on there, clients go on there themselves? So that's a good point, um, Dr. Ruthann. They definitely a great source for people who want to do a cooked homemade diet themselves. Yeah. Um, 
I haven't, and uh, they, so they have what's called the auto balance or easy. So clients can go on, click on it, click the ingredients. It tells you how much supplement to use. It gives you a recipe, um, but the instructions will be cooked. So it will give you the cooked amounts, which sure. doesn't necessarily always translate back to the raw quantity. Um, so like, for example, if I'm formulating a raw diet, I'll input it into the formulator as raw ingredient. Um, now for an otherwise healthy animal, will that make a big difference? Maybe, maybe not. You know, before the DCM cases got so prevalent, I was a little bit more of a cowgirl. Um, <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> now I do err on the side of caution a little bit more. So I do sure. tell people if they want to do raw, um, it is worth the investment in speaking with a, a nutritionist about that. Sure. Yeah. And there are some that won't. So there's a lot of nutritionists, unfortunately, that won't that um some will and we'll just say hey i'm going to tell you to cook it but just don't just use the wrong ingredients it's fine i've formulated it to be that way and you're good um, yeah but it can be tricky definitely that's why we've got experts like you <laughs> uh nicole asked if you could elaborate on the earthworm diet which i think was it's just not a real. hypothetical right yeah, it's a yeah. Joke. Okay. i wish it was real okay. I know I it was real. <laughs> it's a joke. There is, um, there is a diet gym called Jiminy's. Well, it started out as a treat that was made of crickets and it has now expanded. Um, I was just lecturing at Petco's national meeting uh, and they were there in an expo that they've just launched a complete and balanced diet with crickets. Um, I did not get an opportunity to chat with them uh, at the expo, but um, but that's now on the market out there which would be super exciting. My concern about cricket is it's very high in chitin. Yeah. Which it's, I mean, and chitin is used in epichitin, which is used to bind up phosphorus. And so it could potentially bind other nutrients. And so I'd be really interested. So if any of y'all are talking to Jiminy's, I know Jiminy's is a treat. They're great. But Jiminy's the food, um, have they done any diet trials? Um, to yeah. Make sure, and, and specifically testing like taurine whole blood and serum levels to make sure, you know, that's not an issue with the food, but um, exciting that it's becoming more prevalent out there. I hope to yeah. see more. A little bit more mainstream. Uh, and then Lori asked, are cats at risk for heart disease uh, with grain-free diets? Have we seen any real uptick yeah. in numbers with them? Yeah, we have. Some, not as much as dogs, but yes, there have been nutrition associated di dilated cardiomyopathy cases with um, cats. Interesting is their serum and whole blood taurine levels don't change. Dogs actually rarely too, the, the nutrition ones, their, their serum and blood taurine levels don't really change much. They aren't low, um, yeah. but cats don't at all. Um, okay. But they have been, yeah. Yeah, I know that was a big thing right at the beginning of all of this that everybody started kind of supplementing with taurine because they thought that was the magic bullet. And then uh, the research has really not supported taurine as an issue. Right, right. Yeah. It made sense, um, but it, it's looking like it might be something else or uh, right. well, actually multifactorial. Multifactorial, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Including maybe some sort of genetic component in there as yep. well. Yep. Uh, Christy would like to know the reasons why you would steer away from Zewi Peak. Um, I would challenge you to go to Wasava, download the companies, uh, those questions for a pet food company, call them, call them and ask them, and then call a company, call Merrick, call Purina, call Hills, call Royal Canaan, and ask them those same questions and compare the two. Um, that is where companies always lose my trust and faith, is if they don't answer those questions well, who formulates their diets, um, how well regulated it is, what their GMPs are, have they done food testing, are they supporting the veterinary community, are they promoting education, um, what are they doing to better the world um, in general. So yeah, that's what I would, that's what I would challenge you to do and any client that asks you about any other particular pet food. I haven't called them in a long time, so who knows, maybe they have um, done better since the last time I had a student call and ask those questions. But last time I called, the answers were not great and definitely didn't measure up to a company that I would feel comfortable recommending. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And then there also is the Pet Nutrition Alliance um, that has something called Dare to Ask uh, that's on their website. And that's a conglomeration of a whole bunch of different it's actually, there are some pet food companies that are part of it, but then there's uh, veterinary nutritionists who are as well. And they have a list and they go and talk and call to the companies on a regular basis to fill out kind of kind of similar criteria to um, what uh, the Wasava Nutrition Toolkit says. 
uh, but same sort of questions there that they check the boxes of um, for a whole host of, of pet food companies. So that's the Pet Nutrition Alliance. Um, I don't know the website offhand, but you could probably Google it and, and find it. But that's another great resource for, for clients as well, or us too, as an industry. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. Then they have really good like little weight loss calculators on there for quick and easy weight loss for, for patients. It's a, it's a wonderful resource. Yeah, yeah. Well, that is all the questions um, that we had. You have lots of kudos in the chat. So if you need a little ego boost later, you can uh, go go and read that. Um, but, uh, but I do want to thank everybody uh, for staying on, asking great questions, um, participating, and certainly Dr. Conway for Taking a taking a bit of time after your crazy day at work and uh, busy home life to share some of your great knowledge with us. Yes, and I would like to thank you both, Dr. Conway and Dr. Lobos, and a huge thank you to Merrick for um, sponsoring this webinar tonight. I learned so much as just a layperson, and you know the earthworm thing really got me, and then the um, <laughs> fruit fly. I was like, fruit, wow. <laughs> So, and I'm so glad you mentioned the Canine Warrior Project. That that I am glad to see that also. So, thank you so much, Merrick, for doing what you do. Oh, you're welcome. It is an honor. It's really an honor to support that amazing organization. They are just doing some really fantastic stuff for our veterans. Yes, yes. Well, everyone, if there's no more questions, have a great evening and um, take care, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for bearing with us tonight. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.